Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. I have a very complex case here involving a patient who attended with bilateral fully occluding uh, dead skin plugs and dead skin that's uh, lining the ear canal, which we managed to peel. Now, this is their left ear, and believe it or not, the left ear is actually the simpler one out of the two. And the main problem we have uh, with this particular case is that the patient's ear canal entrances are very narrow. They're almost uh, was completely sealed. And we believe the reason for that is this patient had re reported that they were rubbing their ears a lot near the entrance because the ears are blocked and itchy. And by rubbing their ears, it, they got it inflamed and became a bit tender. So uh, at first, I, I just kind of struggled to get the instrument in. But as you can see, we're making good headway now. We managed to, in fact, I've removed all the occluding wax and dead skin already. And I was going to enter the ear after mopping up some of this sticky wax that stained the front section of the ear canal now. They've also got a dead skin layer that's lining the, the floor of the ear canal. We're going to peel this away. It's not actually... Um, it's difficult to visualize at the moment, but you can see here the left side is a bit of the dead skin that was just protruding out. And now slowly but surely we're going to peel this all the way to the eardrum. You will see some blistering um, in the midsection of the ear canal as I peel away the skin. That sometimes can happen. The skin, dead skin can be still quite strongly adhered to the canal wall. And as you remove it, it can cause a little bit of blister. You can just be, see that at the base of the ear canal, but it's nothing to be concerned about. A patient didn't feel it as we were removing the skin, we were unaware of it. So this skin, um, it's not going to improve the patient's hearing by removing this. Um, the occlusion had been already cleared. However, this skin is very unlikely to migrate on its own accord. Typically, uh, dead skin in the ear, it, as it dies and sheds, it moves sideways like a conveyor belt out of the ear, and it's, then it's replaced by another layer of skin underneath. And it's a continuous cycle, so our ear has developed to self-eradicate, self-cleanse um, itself of dead skin. But it's very apparent, obviously, with this skin, that the way it's adhered to the canal, it's not going to come out on its own accord. Hence why I'm going to try and remove as much as possible. The patient is aware that they do suffer from chronic um, earwax and dead skin impaction, and uh, they have to have their ears regularly cleaned. So they are aware that what we're doing today is... It's, it's not going to stop this condition from reoccurring. They're aware of that. They've been having to have the area clean for many, many years. It's the first time they visited myself. They've um, been having problems um, when having their ears cleaned elsewhere. It's been quite uncomfortable for the patient and the struggle to remove um, the occlusion. I can understand why, because the ear canal is so narrow, the entrance. So the patient got recommended to see myself by a friend of theirs who had also seen myself with a similar problem. And we were pleased that they did and um, of course they were able to hear us a lot better after upon leaving. So the eardrum's nice and healthy. I'm just going to mop up some dead skin here as well. This is, uh, we call that the posterior canal wall, so the back part. And also there's some skin superiorly to the roof. It's going to gently peel that away. So this skin is almost like double-sided sticky tape. It's still adhered to the canal wall and it can also envelope itself around the perimeter of a wax plug or dead skin plug. So I'm just trying to go around the air, just get as much dead skin out as, as I possibly can. So just to give you some perspective, uh, the average ear canal, um, it ranges in terms of its dimensions now. Our ears are oval shaped, they're not cylindrical, they're not round tubes, they are, have an oval um, a geometry, and which means that the height is greater than the width. And as you can see here, this, the height of this patient's ear canal is significantly greater than the width, I would say more so than the norm, so it's more of a slit ear canal entrance. And the average width of our ear canals, of course, it, it is a significant um, the range between adults and children and males and females but the average width of an adult's ear canal it can range between 0 0.5 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 or 8 millimeters and the height can also range between about 0 0.7 to 1 millimeters 
and that varies upon um, different sections, different um, parts of the ear canal. The widest sections of the ear canal is typically at the entrance, uh, at, right at the entrance, and also nearest to the eardrum. And then about half a centimetre the, into the ear canal where this patient's ear canal narrows in between the first bend and the second bend, so that uh, first half a centimetre to a centimetre into the ear and also about half a centimetre away from the eardrum. That's where the ear canal is typically at its narrowest. Our ear canals are also slightly inclined. Uh, it's about a 30, 32 degree inclination. Again, that's an average of this range from individual to individual. So we've cleared the patient's left ear. Now this is their right ear. And as you can see, as I enter or attempt to enter with the suction probe, the ear canal just collapses even more. So I'm having to now stretch the ear canal wide open. And that's why I'm so close to the dead skin plug. The skin plug is right near the entrance. Um, so in order to get access, I'm having to stretch the ear canal in. So I'm going in in a moment with the endoscope, or I will do a bit later. And I'm having to stretch the ear open. Hence why I'm close. It's unavoidable. And the idea is to clear up the, the debris near the entrance. And, and that's why it's reflecting as well, because we're right up against it. And even then, I'm really struggling to get in because as you're going in with the suction probe, the ear canal gets attracted by the suction so that it causes the canal to collapse. So I've just about managed to stretch it open enough. And now that I'm in, I, I don't want to come back out with the suction probe until I've cleared the entrance. So now this skin has become quite macerated. It did get some water in there. You can see it's a lot softer. So in part, I suspect it's because they got water in, but also because this ear canal is a lot more narrow. Um, and collapse, it creates a lot more humidity within the ear, so it causes the skin to macerate. It absorbs the moisture, uh, skin cells overhydrate, and then they burst at the membranes, and it becomes mushy like this. So just stretching the ear open, as you can see. And once you get in there, the ear canal does widen, so you can see now, you've got a much better view. So again, I'm just trying to clear I'm trying to clear the wax as we enter so it doesn't reflect and it's not too close to the, to, to, um, to the lens of the endoscope because that can also cause the lens of the endoscope to blur. And if you look carefully, you can actually see all the dead skin. It's, it's, it's structure. It's almost like ribbons. You can see there. You can see how it's coiled upon itself. Dead skin is quite elastic. So this skin, uh, once upon a time, was lining the, the canal wall. Then that skin dies, it sheds, it's replaced by another layer of skin underneath. And this skin, it should migrate out of the ear. And it's a continuous cycle. So once more, I'm just stretching the ear wide open. I'm having to just manipulate the suction probe into the ear. And now you can probably see why in the past this patient's had difficulties in having their ears clean because it's so difficult just to get access in there. Because I can just about see some of the ear from the distance. I'm just going to mop up this dead skin that's at the top. And when you've got this consistency of dead skin, it's, it's probably a more tricky consistency because as you can see, it's not coming out in big blobs. It's breaking away. It's sticky. It's mushy. It's glutinous. It's blocking the inside of the suction probe. Hence, I'm having to come out a few times. And believe it or not, I'm actually using the full zone of suction probe in here. The fine end just is just not powerful enough. It's going to get blocked. So even though this the entrance of this patient is so narrow, I'm actually I've managed to stretch it open wide enough to insert the full zone of suction probe, which is about two point seven millimeters in thickness. So that's the patient's eardrum. It's fully visible now. I'm just going to spend a bit of time to remove as much of this um, debris and dead skin off the canal wall as possible. I've got a slight attic retraction here. You'll see at the top of the eardrum, the membrane, the skin, it's folded over the hammer bone, which created a little pocket at the top. But it's self-cleansing. There's no dead skin migrating and collecting because that can then lead to a cholesteatoma, which is, can, can be very dangerous indeed. You can see the skin underneath looks very healthy. So it's just this old skin just hasn't migrated. It's died and it's shedded, but it's just remained on the canal wall. So I'm just going to stretch the ear open again to the left. So we're almost using the endoscope like a crowbar. So it's multifunctional. The 
and it's, it's not only stretching the ear canal open, but it's also um, enabling me to visualize the earwax. So we're having to not only manipulate the endoscope um, to stretch the ear, but we almost angle it whilst it's in the ear so we can visualize the earwax and go forwards and backwards and up and down, left and right. And all that's being controlled with my non-dominant hand. And my dominant hand is holding the, the instrument because that's the hand that is most likely to cause damage to the ear and its structures. And that's when you need all the, f the finesse and uh, fine motor control. So you require a lot, when you're performing endoscopic earwax removal, you need a lot of bilateral integration. You do also need a lot of bilateral integration with any t technique of removing earwax because if you're using a microscope or head loops, you're holding a speculum into the ear using your non-dominant hand, but you don't have to manipulate it as much. Once you've got the speculum in, there's a bit of manipulation of it, but um, not as much as when you're using an endoscope. So an endoscope can be very difficult to teach people. And in fact, for the last year or so, I've um, decided to, to halt the clear wax training courses because it is becoming more apparent that when we do get delegates in, they're finding the technique very difficult to um, acquire. And it does take a lot of practice. So um, no doubt uh, everyone will be fine after a while but um, a year ago I developed a new device which should have been launched by now but we've just had a bit of a delay and we're, we're all back on course called the wax scope and the wax scope incorporates a speculum so you attach this uh, speculum at the end of the device and that instead is designed to stretch and widen the ear canal so it's more user friendly but the view is not as good as the endoscope but it's the next best thing I feel on the market so I'm very excited about its launch well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.